Every human being is here for a reason. Each of us has our own purpose. I was now almost cut off from what normal people experience. Even though the journey is not smooth now, I still love what I'm doing. I have decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. My name is John Wright. I'm a missionary at the Sacred Heart and I've been a priest for 45 years. And currently, I am the parish priest at a beautiful parish, Our Lady of the Sacred Heart in Adelaide. I've had a really blessed life. My mum is Irish background and she gave me a great sense of the faith, the importance of the faith, the importance of God. And she also taught me to relax and love life and also to forgive others when people do things wrong. My dad is English, born in England, and he taught me a conscientiousness to work hard in life, but also to laugh and have a good time as well. I've got a, a sister who's seven years younger than me. She's married with seven kids and a brother, seven years younger still, and he's married with three kids. I went to a, a fabulous school in a primary school at Cheltenham, and then to St. Bede's College in Mentone. Really loved the brothers. They were fantastic mentors and they fostered a deep sense of religious life. And one of the brothers in particular, Brother Owen, used to take us to different religious houses. And I guess that fostered the sense of a calling within me. And I eventually joined at the rather tender age of 17, the Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. And after 10 years of study, including going to the university in Canberra and doing a theology degree in Melbourne, I was ordained. My first appointment was to rebel in Papua New Guinea. And the reason why I went there was that we really wanted to make sure the teachers in the seminary had some grounding in practical experience. So I offered to go to the missions. So I was sent to Rabaul for a couple of years. I was in the third world and I was amongst simpler people, but people who had a great sense of life. They lived in the present moment. After that, I went to Paris and there I studied liturgy. And that's something I've always loved, celebrating the mass and celebrating the sacraments, something very precious and privileged to be able to do. I had the great fortune of attending different churches with very beautiful liturgies. The French, of course, have an innate sense of beauty and their liturgies are really very beautiful and people sing very powerfully and strongly. So it was a fabulous experience. However, when I was about to do the doctorate, I suffered a, a setback and that was that um, I was getting tension headaches. I decided not to do the doctorate and I came back to Australia and I actually entered parish ministry while also doing a little bit of teaching. And here I was in a beautiful parish of Coogee. Life became a little bit chaotic. I got swept up in a fairly busy parish. And very quickly, I got caught up in Antioch, which was just beginning in Sydney in 1981. And a fabulous movement for young people and also then I did a marriage encounter weekend and so was caught up in the renewal movements. I got a taste of parish life across 16 different parishes across most states in the country. I think I overdid it and I got these tension headaches again. A minor breakdown 
and I had to pull back from that. For a while, I took time off until I got better. Then I came over to Adelaide, still involved in Antioch and marriage encounter and all those sorts of things and loved, loved parish ministry. One of the things John is very clear about is his purpose in life, you know? Because of his spirituality, because of his, uh, his beliefs, because of his strong faith uh, and his purpose in terms of you know, bringing Jesus to make sure Jesus is real in this world, it's been, it's been his absolute driver, you know? And I would often think to myself, I wonder what would happen if he wasn't that strong in terms of his faith and his values and his, and his beliefs. It must be very challenging for him, you know, but every, every Sunday or every time I see him and I'm seeing him a lot, he just turns up. He just turns up and he's got the same energy. And regardless what happens around him or with him or to him, um, he's just got this, this sense of serenity around him. And it's an incredible gift. The charismatic renewal, all those sorts of things have not only given me life, but I think they've been transformative for people in their own lives and brought them closer to Jesus. He wants to change the church from being a place of maintenance to a place of mission, that we are doing stuff, we are outreach, uh, we're offering outreach, we're connecting with people and we are bringing Jesus back into the people's lives, making them have a one-on-one -on -one connection and a transformative um, experience with Jesus because that's what it's all about. In 2015, with life going on very well and all of a sudden something happened to me. For me, life changed rather suddenly on the 22nd of July, 2015, when I uh, received the diagnosis that I had kidney cancer, renal cancer, and it was the fourth stage. It uh, came really out of the blue for me. I had had some intimations that there was something not quite right over the previous six months, a couple of occasions when there was blood in the urine, but it passed quickly and uh, I thought, oh well, whatever it is, it's gone. Around the beginning of July, I couldn't pass water and I drove myself to the hospital in the middle of the night. I was admitted and after a while they did tests and so on. And then on the 22nd of July, that's when they told me what I had. It was an incredible shock. And I know when I left the hospital, they said to me, we're going to put you on a treatment which will mean taking two tablets a day for the rest of your life. And there's a third of the chance that these tablets will work, and which will be good. A third of a chance that they'll do nothing, and a third of the chance that they'll actually make the cancer grow. So I became nervous. And of course, I was in this state of shock I found myself suddenly on a, a new journey. The ordinariness of life changed dramatically. I was now almost cut off from what normal people experience. I was on a very sort of a lonely journey and I had to deal with it. I couldn't help thinking that my sister's kids, their little children, 
and they were quite a few toddlers, I wouldn't see them grow up. I remember a doctor telling me that the average lifespan on these tablets was three and a half years. So I had that firmly planted in my mind. And that was a, a very sad sort of a thing to think of the fact that I wouldn't see my family keep growing. I remember trying to meditate because I meditate every morning and sometimes I just couldn't think. So I went back to a form of meditation, which I've always loved, and that is just sitting in the Lord's presence and saying a mantra. And the mantra I've chosen comes from the, comes from the great uh, writer Dante, in your will is our peace. And I remember just saying it and being in the Lord's presence and finding a measure of peace and trust. In my normal day, I tried to carry on, but it was a, a massive challenge for me to do that because I'd be distracted by thoughts of, I'm not going to be around for too much longer. But when I was able to meditate in the morning and sometimes in the evening, I could recover a little bit of peace and freedom. So I was on these tablets for three months before it was, they were tested to see whether the medication was actually working or not. They were very difficult three months, I remember, and I guess the uh, medication was moving into my system, so I felt very tired, and sometimes uh, my, my mind w wasn't able to concentrate, and I remember saying mass sometimes and just wanting to sit down. So it was a, a pretty challenging time, and of course, always at the back of my mind, there was fear, fear that the medication wasn't working. After three months of, of this medication and battling through, in a sense, I had a CT scan and a blood test, and the results were positive. The cancer had shrunk a lot in some areas, so that was great news. And then the oncologist said, I'm now going to send you to a surgeon because we're going to remove the kidney, the offending kidney. So that was good news, great news. And of course, because of the anxiety I'd been feeling, I felt a burst of relief. So I had that operation to remove the kidney. Towards the end of that year, 2015, I recuperated and I was back doing things, being a parish priest. We just started looking at evangelization. So I really felt called to do something in that area. Of course, I had to, to deal with the suffering. I've never actually questioned why me actually, to be honest, but I've had to deal with the fact that I've got it, my life will be shorter. I really wanted to stay if I could. While I've got life, I'll stay. In the last three years, I've been going okay. However, even just last week, I went along for my regular six week checkup. And every two months, I've had CT scans. For the first time, really, the news was not so good because my current medication, which I've been on for over three years, is now slowing down in its effectiveness. And in fact, there's a little growth of the cancer in the lungs, and I've also got a little lump of cancer in the back. At the moment, I'm hobbling a bit. I had imagined it was sciatica, 
But as soon as I went in to see the oncologist, he took a closer look at the recent CT scan and saw it was uh, cancerous. So I've got to have radiation therapy on that. And we've got to try a new whole drug or new whole treatment, and it's called immunotherapy. So it's another stage. Anybody on a cancer journey knows that things change. You can be going well one moment and then another moment, things go wrong. I often ask Father John how he is or if he's okay because he does not offer information about his pain and his suffering, which is inspiring. And yet I know he is tired. I'm aware of his grief and yet he still almost misses nothing. He still attends the meetings and shows up and tries to bring his best self. And he encourages authentic communications and those around him that are focused on personal relationships with Jesus and with each other. So I hope I learn relationship ministry through him and also learn how to not complain and focus on what's wrong because he doesn't. I don't know as much about his physical suffering as likely he, he could share <laughs> because he doesn't. A beautiful friend from Sydney, and she's been an oncological nurse for many years. And she said, the best advice I can give you is this, go on living your life as normally as you can. Have coffee. If you enjoy coffee, have a meal with friends. Do the normal things you're doing. I just love being a priest, and I'm excited at this moment by the wonderful things that are happening in our parish. Even though the journey is not smooth now, I still love what I'm doing. We have to remind him that he has limitations. Overall, it doesn't slow him down. He's an inspiration because he has a man that's been told that you know, you've got limited time, and yet he's still giving, instead of you know, getting overcome by his disease and thinking about it, sometimes he does think about it, but he focuses on where we want to take the church. I've had a strong conviction recently over the last 18 months or so, but particularly from the middle of last year, that we really have to change in our parishes if we're going to turn around the, the dwindling numbers of people coming. We've got to be proactive and we've really got to try to evangelize and learn how to evangelize well. We've done Alpha in our parish for over two years and a couple of hundred people have done Alpha. That's a grand blessing for us, which means our focus now is more and more on what we can do to evangelize, to really reach out to the younger generation. Our focus again is still on Alpha, but really broadening that to what we do at Sunday Mass. He is one that has got the people to realize that we need to change the way we, we embrace church and embrace the rest of the people because he's been able to convince people that, or show people that the church is declining in numbers and we need to change the way we do things so we can start bringing people back into church. We've been known as a pretty welcoming parish, but we can do a lot more because when anybody comes into our church, somebody should say hello to them. And it should be a few people that say hello to them. Then our music, we're really trying hard to have a little bit more of praise and worship in our, our Sunday liturgies so that people can more freely praise God and thank God. So what I've been trying to do to engage people more is uh, to use our projector and to have some overheads so that people can see different things as well as hear my voice. And I tend to stand out at the front a little bit more. That's the sort of thing they were doing there. And I, I feel called to do that as well. So there's some of the things we're doing to change on the Sunday, to make it a little more engaging. I've always loved the contemplative side of our church. 
I think that's something we've got. We've got monasteries, especially in other parts of the world, that really are oases of prayer and of peace. We don't have many in this land, but after being to a Cistercian monastery and to Teze, I thought, well, we've got to try to have a little bit of that spirit here. And so we have every Monday night a contemplative mass, a candlelit mass. We have contemplative music. I don't preach so much as read a reflection. We can take in the Mass a little bit more deeply than normal Mass. What struck me most, my husband um, is not Catholic and is only just learning about the faith. And upon getting to know Father John, my husband said, uh, from what I know about this guy, Jesus, Father John seems just like him, to know you're going to die and continue to give of yourself more and more and more, um, even though the people around you might not realize that these could be your last days. 10,000 Reasons by Matt Redman really touched me in my journey. Whenever I sing the last verse, the third verse, I sort of almost choke up. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending, 10,000 years and forevermore. I just find that so moving because ultimately, of course, what we're trying to do is give praise to God and to develop our relationship with Jesus. We as a parish, I feel just so privileged to be part of that. And I know this is one of the most exciting things in my life ever as a priest. When Jesus says to us from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10, have always meant such a lot to me. I have come that you may have life and lead your life to the full. Greetings from Brisbane, Australia, which is very far from where most of you are. In Jesus Christ, what we hear, what we discover is the good news. Here we find in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, good news for everybody. And that's why Shalom Media really does have a contribution to make. Shalom Media is seeking to communicate to families and to show to the world the truth and the beauty of what the family is within the plan of God. May the blessing of God really come to you through all that is offered in uh, Shalom World by, by Shalom Media. The word Shalom itself comes from Hebrew, as you know, and it means peace. May the blessing of God's peace, the Shalom of God, for which we were created, may it come to you from the God who is peace, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.